Salutations, everybody. Saludos a todos. My name is Emmanuel Morales, also known as Manny, and my artist name is CA. I'll be presenting to you on the topic of low writing, our culture, our identity. So I'm going to be doing this uh, through the PowerPoint um, in the PowerPoint format. But just to give you a heads up, I'm also going to be simultaneously recording the audio a version of this for my podcast, the book, The Endless Pursuit of Knowledge, which is available on most major um, podcast apps or platforms, including Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Um, and the visual version of it is going to be available on my YouTube channel, so keep an eye out for that. I'll make sure to document the links, to add the links to each uh, post that I do. That way you can easily find um, the alternate version of it. And so to get things started, I want to focus today on or start by focusing on the image that you see here, which is the cover of my PowerPoint presentation. This image is really important to me for a lot of reasons, um, but I'm going to break it down to you because if you are listening in on the audio version on the podcast, you're not going to be able to see it right away. So hopefully you'll be able to hit the link and go check it out. But the images of a 1993 um, Cadillac Fleetwood. And this is my brother's car. And it's parked up against the curb at the JC, Santa Rosa Junior College, um, in that roundabout or that horseshoe area. And so the reason that this is really important to me is because um, if you know the history of low riding here in Sonoma County, here in Santa Rosa specifically, then you also know that low riding was um, outlawed, low riding was frowned upon, and there were a lot of um, policies around it and strategies that the police used to try to deter people from being out low riding. Santa Rosa Junior College is on Mendocino Avenue, and Mendocino Avenue here. Um, in Santa Rosa was the main spot where people would go cruising. Um, it has a long history, but I got to see it. I got to experience it in the late 90s and early 2000s as the police were starting to crack down and, like I said, use different strategies to try to um, deter people from doing it, from being out and about, from getting together. So for this car to be sitting in front of the JC, for me, able to, for me to be able to take this picture, um, it's important because, uh, you know, when people would be out there cruising, uh, people would get pulled over for the music, for how loud the music was, for the height of the car, for using hydraulics, for cruising too slow. Um, people would get ticketed. Um, some cars even got impounded. And like I said, it was all a strategy to try to keep people away. Um, so to kind of uh, speed up a little bit and uh, bring it up to, to date. This picture was taken a couple years ago. My brother let me borrow the car to bring it to the Metro Youth Conference. And so I've been privileged to organize and collaborate with um, these student organizations to bring on low riders to the campus. And one thing to have it, to have several cars parked on campus around the water fountain in front of the library between that and the bookstore uh, was important for me, right? It's symbolic. Um, and to have that, that privilege, to have that, that opportunity to be able to collaborate with the student groups makes it that much more powerful because this is all done in an effort to try to um, reverse that mentality or um, that stereotype of a low rider um, as uh, gang involved or gang associated to convert it into embracing the car culture, embracing the art form, embracing the lifestyle and letting that be part of the higher learning environment. It's pretty special to me. So, you know, I'm going to break down some of the things that you see right off the bat, the low rider rims, also known as spokes. Um, in the wheel well, you see the suspension with some chrome. Um, as well as the frame with some patterns um, and pinstripe on it. Um, throughout the car, you also see more patterns, more pinstriping, gold leafing, um, the chrome trim, the chrome bumper, and the 
castle grill in the front, right? And it's sitting in that uh, roundabout or that horseshoe in front of the JC. And like I said, we've even had the opportunity to have the car on campus, literally on the bricks there. And so we're gonna go into the presentation and I'm gonna break it down into several eras um, or faces, if you wanna refer to it that way. And we're gonna start with the, with the origins of the car culture and um, the Chicano culture around it. And so I'm gonna bring it back to the 1930s, 1940s and 1950s. And so it begins in the Southwest states of the United States, that is uh, California, Arizona, Nuevo Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Nevada, um, and a couple other states that, that um, had a large Mexican-American population, right? So back then, I want to point out that there was a lot of discrimination, a lot of racism, a lot of oppression, and it was all or mostly aimed at um, the Mexican-American and indigenous community, the Native American community here. And, um, you know, they were deemed second-class citizens. Um, segregation was very much part of the politics and the societal kind of construct of the Southwest. Um, also in the 1930s, as a result of the Great Depression and the economic downfall, uh, Mexican Americans were scapegoated as being the blame for the economic downfall. And so there was a policy in place that allowed the government to uh, create a mass deportation program called the Repatriation Act of the 1930s. And it's important if you want to look into it, kind of get some of the context around it. There is a movie that I feel like does a really good job of depicting that um, what was happening, the struggles, um, both, um, you know, civically and, and culturally, um, and that's Mi Familia. So if you get a chance to check it out, um, there are several actors, well-known actors now um, who were part of that film. Um, but I feel like in general, it does a really good job of um, depicting what that was like. Uh, I want to talk about some of the prevalent terms, identity terms that were used and during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, one of them was being was that of uh, being Mexican. Mexican referred to people born in Mexico of Mexican nationality or Mexican descent. Also Mexican American, and that referred to people of Mexican descent but born in the United States. Um, during that time, um, there was also the term being used as Chicano, Chicana, and that was more of a derogatory term. That was um, to stereotype, that was to degrade um, Mexicans and to shame them for, for their roots. The term Pachuco Pachuca also became popular in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, it referred to the Mexican-American youth who would dress in suit suits, which was a style that was inspired by the African-American community of um, the East Coast of the Northern States, New York, um, and also the uh, the Midwest area where they would go to clubs to play uh, blues and jazz and dressed in suit suits or um, those big uh, coats, kind of a suit style with the pants that were uh, creased, um, kind of high-waisted, but it, it looked nice. It had a, it was a nice way to present yourself um, I also want to point out that during those times, uh, not everyone had the ability or the economic means to uh, have a lot of clothes or have a lot of suits. So for the youth, it, was, it became a thing of pride to be able to take care of their clothes, to present themselves well, to iron and to have it all done up um, and put away when they weren't wearing it. So um, it became part of the 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 Chicano culture, part of the Pachuco culture, which was as a result of, um, it resulted as a, as a subculture from the African-American culture, right? Uh, I also wanna talk about 
what was labeled as the Susu riots in 1943. This was an incident of violence that originated in the streets of Los Angeles as Navy men uh, came home on break from the war, were out at the bars. There was an altercation that occurred that led to mass violence against uh, Pachuco youth um, or youth, you know, dressed in, in their attire. Um, so the, the focus of the violence was aimed at brown youth, essentially. And so even though the Navy men who were mostly of white or Anglo descent, um, even though they init initiated or instigated the violence, it was still labeled as the Susu riots as a way to scapegoat the blame onto the brown youth. And it's really important to consider that. Um, also to study it, look into it if you can. I also wanna talk about the car culture at the time. Um, it was mostly Chevys that were being customized. Um, the cars were usually family cars. Um, the style developed around it was all about being um, low and slow, which meant lowering the rear end of the car um, to give it sort of this mean look as it cruised down the street. And slow just basically mean, meant that you were cruising out and about, not in a rush, but just kind of taking it slow. Um, so it became about style, it became about looks. And um, counter to that, or the opposite car culture to that, at the time was the hot rods, which was mostly Fords that were um, customized, their engines were customized. Um, the focus was on speed and aerodynamics, which is why they lowered the front end. And so the car culture, the Chicano car culture was then developed as a, as a counterculture in that sense. Um, like I said, it was family cars. So there wasn't a whole lot of modifications that they could do to it, at least permanently. So in order to lower it in the back, they, sometimes they would use uh, bricks or sandbags or cronky, concrete bags in order to temporarily lower the car from the back. And then as soon as they would go home and drop it off to their parents, they would take out those bags or the bricks and get it back to stock height or factory height. Um, so it was, it was difficult to modify the suspensions at that time. I also wanna highlight uh, and embrace that at the core of the culture during those times, um, values were really important and the values uh, centered around family, respect and honor were one of the main ones, right? And, and I highlight that because a lot of the times due to stereotypes and prejudices, we tend to uh, criminalize or easily um, alienate those who, who at the core of themselves um, and their beliefs have uh, respectable, um, respectable values. All right, so some of the pictures that you see in this slide, I'll just kind of break it down. There's some, some youngsters, some youth dressed in their Chicano attire. Uh, also the Pachucas and the Pachuco attire, I'm sorry. Also the Pachucas down at the bottom right. Um, on the left, on the bottom left, there's a police officer kind of inspecting. Uh, looks like he might have a Pachuco detained. And the top right is uh, an image um, from the time of the Susu riots, and that is of a of a youth that it has his clothes stripped, uh, was thrown out on the on the pavement or the sidewalk as a way to shame them for their roots, shame them for their culture, um, and ultimately allow that um, that discrimination to persist. All right, going on to the next slide. This era, I consider La Causa. This is the 1960s and 70s um, in the United States. And as uh, history has taught us, my apologies, I took a quick drink. Um, as history has taught us, this was the, the times, the, the era of the civil rights. And um, so the civil rights were centered around the treatment of African-Americans in the United States, their ability to, to vote, to own property, um, and to desegregate our communities. Um, and at the same time, 
um, Mexicans, Mexican Americans, and other um, communities of color um, organize to also fight for civil rights as well as student rights and labor rights. Uh, during this time, discrimination persisted, as did segregation, uh, police brutality, and abuse of power came in all shapes and forms and sizes um, from the police officers uh, who patrolled the neighborhoods to uh, the way that people in public office um, um, did things ethically and unethically um, in an effort to um, discriminate against others, as well as um, the businesses and how they would um, reject customers based on their their skin color or language that they spoke. Um, but also during this time came the piece about organizing. And so a lot of community organizations came together um, to build and develop um, a sense of security in the communities, a sense of protection, a sense of, um, of guidance with many organizations focusing on, on civil and labor rights. Also during that time, uh, many gangs started to form. The youth that um, were frustrated with the system, frustrated with the conditions they were living in, began to unify and started to create um, some of the gangs that we know now. Um, unfortunately, due to the violence that has occurred over the last the last few decades. Um, but also on the, around that time, uh, car clubs started to organize. So car builders began to form groups and um, those groups, similar to the jacket clubs that existed in the 40s and 50s, um, these car groups developed or evolved into a car club um, with membership status, membership rights, um, and their ability to to co-build or co-create um, the cars. Um, some of the established car clubs from the 60s and 70s were Imperials Car Club, Techniques Car Club, Lifestyle Car Club, and Click. Um, they're all Southern California based, um, the majority of them being um, LA, specifically LA based car clubs. Um, and, you know, in a future slide, we're gonna talk about how they expanded and evolved um, to include uh, more clubs, more chapters and all that. Um, also during the 1960s and 70s, you start to see the, the developing or development or progression of, of car customization. Um, the craftsmanship. Um, you see the image of this 1964 Impala um, that is called Gypsy Rose. It's custom painted. All the, the roses um, on the car, they're all hand painted. Um, this car now sits in um, the, the National um, Car Hall of Fame. Basically, I'm, I'm blanking on the name now, but it is now recognized as as this national treasure. Um, and it's a lowrider car. It's kind of cool to see that. And you also see other images, uh, Brown Berets who organized um, at the same time that the Black Panthers were organizing. And a film that kind of captures, uh, well, not kind of, but it does a, a really good job capturing um, that that tight family mentality, uh, as well as the Chicano culture and being part of that subculture, um, as well as the impacts of, of gang violence is Boulevard Nights. Um, so don't just take it for entertainment, but also as a way to kind of educate yourself. Um, I highly suggest watching that movie. And so during this time of car craftsmanship, um, the full customization, the paint jobs, interiors, hydraulics start to be introduced. Uh, hydraulics originally were all airplane parts uh, that were being used to lower and uh, raise the car, eventually getting it to a place where it could actually hop. Um, not huge hops, but 
you know, it was, it became competitive then once enough people started doing it. And so along with, uh, with the craftsmanship, um, evolving comes, um, the introduction of car modification laws. And these were laws practiced by, uh, the police departments to deter people from cruising and from building cars that, um, resemble lowriders. Um, also just as the, the gangs were forming, the community organizations were, were forming, um, and, and the, the importance of low riders as well as uh, the attractiveness of low riders started to grow It started to include other, um, other minorities, other ethnic minorities. Um, to become more multicultural. And so you start to see the African-American community also start to develop their, um, to build their own cars and develop their um, car clubs. Moving on to the next era, this is what I call overcoming the warfare um, to symbolize how uh, low riders continued uh, to evolve, continue the, the culture continued to grow. And this was during the 1980s and 90s. So during this time, um, the, the evolution of traditional roll riders went from being primarily uh, Chevys, bombs, trucks, and the big body cars to then including um, the mini trucks and Euros. Uh, mini trucks like this uh, Nissan depicted here on the picture had custom paint job, custom interior, um, gold plated everything. The the uh, bed cover that raised um, some of the trucks would um, would have hydraulics in the bed so that the bed itself could be manipulated and turned and twisted. It would be called uh, dancing the bed. And then you see the door that it uh it opens not conventionally it, it opens in a way that is considered suicide um so basically the hinges are on the opposite ends and it opens um towards the front rather than towards the back and so um yeah the car clubs began to expand nationally so it went from just being a socal based uh movement into creating several chapters throughout the united states and then as a result of that, you start to see mainstream America um, incorporating lowriders more into music, movies, and, um, and magazines. Um, lowriders then became closely associated with, with rap music or rap culture. Um, Easy being one of the first uh, uh, artists to feature lowriders, and then it became synonymous with the culture. Um, you also have films like Boys in the Hood that um, had a lowrider um, kind of at the forefront of the film. Um, and so then it became closely um, associated to street culture, to uh, the violence that occurs in the community, um, but also in general just to, to the L.A. culture. Um, and Lowrider Magazine, Lowrider Magazine uh, hit an international level. It began distributing its magazine throughout the world. And so that kind of fueled the popularity of um, Lowrider as a culture, um, not just a, a subculture at that point or a counterculture, but more of a, of a mainstream culture. And so other, other um, nations began to buy into it and began to build their own. And I'll kind of talk about that in the next slide. Um, then you also have films like Blood In, Blood Out and several others that are depicting Chicano culture at the time um, as it was being impacted by violence um, and still civil, right, civil rights issues, um, social issues and stuff like that. So um, really important to, to check out the um, what the film industry was depicting at the time. Um, some which I agree with and other which is, is um, I feel like is, is a better representation. You know, you kind of pick and choose what you want to watch. Um, during this time also, there's anti-cruising laws. So just like in the 60s and 70s, there was anti-modification laws. 
Um, in the 80s and 90s, uh, it became more about anti-cruising laws. They couldn't control who was building lowriders. So instead, they were going to control um, who was out cruising, who was out gathering. Um, some of the main uh, boulevards or streets out in L.A., uh, Crenshaw Boulevard and and other streets that became popular for lowriders, um, along with that came anti-cruising laws that would try to deter people from being out. So that's where uh, it became outlawed to be out driving around. Here locally on Mendocino Avenue, um, the police department used different strategies to try to deter people from being out there. Um, Mendocino Avenue is a four lane road, two in each direction. And so one of the strategies they would use was to um, narrow it down to two lanes, therefore creating uh, traffic congestion um, and also making it easier to ticket people, um, to tow people's cars, impound them and do all that um, as a way to try to, you know, get people off the street um, or catch them with loud music or using the, the um, hydraulics, uh, things like that. So they try to discourage people from being from large gatherings and, and uh, being out in the street. And so many of the people who live here in Sonoma County, in Santa Rosa, uh, remember those times. And eventually it got to the point where the cruising had to move um, and people had to organize it a little bit more, a little bit better. Um, but still, the place to be is, is uh, Mendocino Avenue and now also um, Sebastopol Road which is at the heart of uh, the Rosen area, the Rosen district here in Santa Rosa. Um, aside from the anti-cruising laws, you also had gang violence getting national attention. So for the incidents that were occurring in some of the biggest cities in, in the United States, it was creating a stereotype and a, a burden to, to have gangs and gang activity in the cities. Um, so then um, the government and police agencies started to uh, organize gang injunctions, which was another way to deter people from um, being out, um, organizing, getting together um, as official gangs. Um, a lot of it was done in what they felt was um, Kind of a preventative uh, approach, uh, but what really turned into gang documentation, so documenting people as gang members, associates, or affiliates, uh, incarceration, it contributed to mass incarceration um, in our prison and jail systems, and um, it really took away from resources from the community. So. Um, nothing about it was proactive, if anything, it created more issues. And now our systems are overwhelmed with, with mass incarceration, with mass amounts of people being detained and labeled as gang members. All right, so I'm gonna move on to our next slide. And this kind of brings it more up to speed to current date. Um, I call this slide the here to stay or this, this era here to stay from uh, Y2K till. And so from the 2000s up until now, um, the lowrider scene has seen uh, a massive growth, massive uh, progression. It has hit the international scene. Um, clubs are now established in different countries. It's not just um, Southern California based or um, nationally here in the States, but also um, at the international level. You see car clubs that are in Germany, car clubs that are in Japan, uh, Mexico, uh, South America, all over the place um, that are branches of car clubs that were first established in, in California or in L.A. Um, and I feel like all this is part of the evolution of, of lowriders. And now it, it includes uh, B-class or motorcycles. So you see the picture of the motorcycle that the paint job resembles that of a low rider. It has the white walls, the spoke rims. Um, the seat is customized, um, made to resemble that of an interior of a car. And so 
you have that. You have uh, other styles of cars that uh, the paint jobs resemble, the the rims might resemble, the interior or the sound systems might resemble that of a lowrider, of a traditional lowrider, but it has evolved um, to include other other styles of cars, other styles of car cultures. Um, there's also new films that depict uh, the lowrider scene or the Chicano culture in a better light, um, Pachuco culture in a better light. The I feel like um, it's all in an effort to restore the image uh, of the culture, to be more inclusive, and um, just to you know to to undo um, the negative stereotypes that have been uh, put in place. And the lowrider shows definitely uh, hit the international scene. Um, in the early 2000s, I started to see a lot of uh, Midwest cities start to host their own uh, lowrider shows um, at their own venues. And then from there, just kind of keeping up with Lowrider Magazine, seeing what was happening internationally. You also see other countries kind of get into it. Um, so at the bottom right of the slide, you see um, folks of Japanese descent um, who are in, you know, in a lot of ways dressed like Chicanos, dressed like Mexican-Americans. Um, and the tattoo style, the clothing, the um the cars that, that they own or they build uh, closely resemble the traditional lowriders and, and Chicano Chicana lifestyle here in, in California. Um, I feel like at this point, the customization has hit a new level. The car value has definitely increased. It went from family owned cars to cars that are valued upwards of 35, 40, 50, um, or even more um, thousands of dollars. Uh, and it goes from the traditional uh, bomb, bomb truck, or big body cars to um, the big bodies of the 1990s, as well as um, still those Euros are out there, the mini trucks are out there. And um, definitely the hydraulic, the evolution of the hydraulic is now allowing cars to, to hit back bumper. That's what it's called. And, to raise the front uh, 12 to 16 feet above and have hoppy competitions, um, sometimes to the point where the car flips and falls on, on its roof. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious how, how that has increased or evolved. The paint jobs, definitely. Um, there are a lot of great painters out there uh, pinstripers and muralists who have done work on cars um, and keep that uh, that art form uh, as vivid as possible. Um, the interiors, for sure, the different materials that are being used in the cars, um, the different styles. Some people keep it traditional. Some people like to incorporate more custom. And so you'll, you'll see that, that variety. All right. And so next, I'll talk a little bit about, actually, I'll go back to, to the previous slide. Um, in the center of the page, there is a, a PlayStation 2 lowrider game. I remember when my brother got that game for me, uh, and all I would do is sit there and, like, build a car, customize it some, and then hop it. And it was a pretty, pretty simple game. Um, but for me, the idea that this car culture became so mainstream to the point that it had a, a video game designed after it, I felt like that was the most symbolic thing that could happen, right? It's being depicted in movies and and uh, music videos and things of that sort. But to have a video game, I felt like took it to the next level. And again, I felt like it all went back to to the idea of of restoring the image of a lowrider. So I'm gonna uh, touch base on some of the identity terms that I brought up. Um, and break them down a little bit more. Um, so the identity and stereotypes, um, sometimes, you know, that causes um, issues of, of self-identity, of, um, of empowerment or, or esteem. 
but it's really important to to acknowledge them and to learn about them. And uh, I want to start with the term Mexica that refers to the peoples of Central Mexico, also known as the Aztecs. And that civilization, how a lot of us are, um, are, you know, direct or through a long lineage of uh, blood um, related to the Mexica people of Mexico. And that's also where the, the word for the country comes from, Mexico, derived from Mexica, Mexica people. Mestizo, I wanna also um, highlight that it was a, a derogatory term meant for people of mixed blood. Um, it meant that, you know, you came from um, a European uh, parent and uh, an indigenous parent or, or bloodline. So you had a mixed blood and it wasn't necessarily seen as a positive thing. It was part of the caste system that was in colonial Mexico. And so um, something to be conscious of and to look into. Mexicans, again, people that are born in Mexico of Mexican nationality or Mexican um, um, ancestry or heritage. Mexican Americans are also descendants of Mexicans, but born in the United States. And so the clear distinction is there that Mexicans are originally from Mexico, Mexican nationals, and Mexican Americans are folks born in, in the United States, but of Mexican heritage or descent. Um, also the term Latinos, Latinas, Latinx, uh, the, that term comes from people who are of Spanish speaking um, descent, but have indigenous or African roots. And so it's inclusive uh, of uh, most folks from Central, from Northern Central and South America. And Hispanics, Hispanics is more associated with people who have a direct tie um, to Spain, direct bloodline to Spain um, and are Spanish speaking. Chicanos, Chicanas, Chicanex, that's another term that, like I said, at first was derogatory in the 30s, 40s and 50s. In the 1960s, it became a, per, a term of empowerment. It was reappropriated to mean something positive for our community, especially for our youth who were fighting for uh, civil rights, um, political and um, student rights. Um, and the term Chicanex now is, it's another evolution of the term which is more inclusive of uh, different gender identities, gender terms, and also maintaining that sense of gender neutrality. Pachucos and pachucas, though refers to the suit suitors. And from my understanding, the way that term came to be is that um, it referred to the youth out in Texas who were or in Texas who were gonna go party in El Paso, and they would refer to uh, El Paso as chuco, and so when they would say, hey, where are you going? On the bus, oh, voy pachuco. So that kind of stuck, right? It's pachuco. Um, we're going to chuco. So um, pachucos, pachucas are, are known as suit suitors. And the term cholo is another term that was initially um, or originally a derogatory term. Um, this was a way to uh, degrade somebody kind of call them a low life or a no good person, um, pretty much referring to them as a dog. Um, it comes from the term Sholos Quintli, and which is the term for, um, for dog in Nahuatl, and um, also known as the, the breed of dogs, Sholos Quintli. Um, but my understanding is that during the colonization of Mexico, the Spaniards created institutions that were known as prisons at the time, prisons or, or jails. And so the people that they had incarcerated there, so, um, kind of like calling them inmates, uh, they would call them cholos, but as a way to, again, degrade them um, and dehumanize them. Um, again, that's another term that got uh, reappropriated. It became another term of empowerment for a lot of people who are 
who were called or deemed cholos, right? It's it's kind of that mindset of um, of creating chaos. Um, if you're gonna call me a cholo, then I'm gonna be the baddest cholo, and so it it's not very much you know a term that is not necessarily derogatory. Yes, some people use it to demean others, but uh, or to talk down to others, but uh, for the most part, it's become this uh, term of empowerment for those who are um, gang associated or involved. And so the last thing that I want to do is kind of talk about the stereotypes. And um, I want to focus on the positive stereotypes of any of the um, identity terms that you that you have heard. Or when I reference Chicano culture, when I reference the lowrider scene, the lowrider culture, what are some of the positive stereotypes that you can think of, right? And I'll leave you with that question for you to ask yourself and to think about. And um, on the on the reverse side, I also want you to think about the negative stereotypes, because usually the negative stereotypes are easier to get to, easier to uh, to verbalize. Um, but one thing that I want to caution you and that I want to also get you to think is uh, about the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And that's this idea that somebody is bound to become whatever they're being called constantly, right? It becomes, uh, it becomes true for them. It becomes real for them. For example, for those that were often called cholos, no good people, low lives, um, but you constantly heard the term cholo being used against you. Uh, eventually you got to the point where you're like, okay, you're going to call me Cholo, then I'm going to become the biggest Cholo you know, or the baddest Cholo you know. And therefore kind of um, um, living up to that term or um, how, else can I, how else can I say it? Um, kind of embodying that term, right? It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It becomes true for you. So I want to caution you, make sure that if you're a youngster out there that is constantly being told negative things or you have negative terms being used against you, um, to be self-aware, to be conscious of what the impact could be uh, for yourself because, you know, nobody wants to see you being harmed or for you to harm no one else. And so be cautious with how you um, soak that in and how you live up to it. Um, if you want to reach out to me, uh, please do so. I'll be leaving you my uh, contact information at the end of this video. Um, I don't think I did my uh, disclaimer at the beginning. I just want to let you know that all this information is information that I myself have, have researched. Um, different resources, different conversations. I've learned things along the way. And I was able to incorporate it into this presentation. This presentation, I've done it for several years now at the Mecha Youth Conference, at the Ndocu Conference. Um, and I've had the privilege of the privilege of presenting it in Newman Auditorium, which is one of the first places where I got to hear a presentation at the JC as a student, as an 18-year-old, kind of fresh out of high school, not knowing what college was going to be like or even if it was for me. I was there at a presentation regarding immigrant rights. And uh, a couple years ago, I kind of came full circle and I was able to be to present from that very first place um, that I got to hear a presentation. Not only that, I got to present on this topic. And so for me, it was more symbolic than anything. So again, this information is information that I myself have researched or learned about and I incorporated into this uh, this presentation. I don't claim to know everything and some of the information around um, the Chicano culture, the lowrider culture um, can be difficult to, to obtain or hard to, uh, you know, to, to capture. So if you are in the know of knowledge around this topic or these topics that I presented, if you have wisdom to share, please reach out to me. I welcome any and all um, wisdom and knowledge, and hopefully I can at some point incorporate it into this. Um, my Instagram is at arte por CA. That's at arte underscore por underscore CA. And if you want to check out the work that I do with the youth um, here in our community in Santa Rosa, California, 
uh, specifically in Roseland. You can check out my uh, restorative page. That's um, Manny the Restorative. So on Instagram at Manny underscore the underscore restorative. Um, keep an eye out for this um, this uh, visual, this visual presentation, and also the audio presentation that I've recorded for my podcast. It'll be available um, soon, and you can share it out. So I'll tag the link information on each presentation, and hopefully you all have easy access to it. All right. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. I appreciate all y'all. Keep it forward. Siempre para adelante.